So uh, by now, we will start our scientific session. So uh, please let me introduce uh, Professor uh, Dr. Samir Helmi Asad. He is the professor and former head of the Department of Internal Medicine, Alexandria University. He founded the Center for Food Care for Subjects with Diabetes in Alexandria, Egypt, and helped in founding similar centers in China, Zimbabwe, and Ecuador. He also shared in the foundation of Alexandria University, CRC, and two NGOs, hospitals in Alexandria. He's the editor in chief of the Journal of the Egyptian Association of Endocrinology, Diabetes, and Metabolism. Uh, please, uh, Professor Dr. Samir. Uh, dear colleagues, good evening. Masail Khair, Kulusana Untu Tayyibin, Ramadan Kareem. Welcome to this continuous professional development activity, kindly sponsored by Eva Pharma. It's my pleasure to introduce Professor Aaron, an international pillar in the domain of incretin therapy. Professor Bo Aaron received his MD at Lund University, Sweden, where since 1999 he has held the position of Professor in Clinical Metabolic Research. He has been the Dean of the Faculty of Medicine, Lund University, from 2006 to 2011. Since 2015, he is Pro Vice Chancellor of the University. He has combined basic science with clinically oriented research to focus on islet function with a special aim of understanding the regulation and mechanism of normal islet cell function and the mechanism and consequences of islet cell dysfunction as an important factor underlying type 2 diabetes. He has also worked and developed new targets and compounds for the treatment of type 2 diabetes. In this area, he has, during many years, concentrated on incretin actions with particular emphasis on developing new treatment based on the incretin hormone glucagon-like peptide. He has been particularly instrumental for the development of the DPP4 inhibitors, and he performed the first study showing the ability of this therapy, and this was in 2002. It's a great honor, Professor, to have you amongst us this evening, and uh, uh, you will deliver an important and uh, very interesting uh, presentation entitled DPP-4 Inhibitors, Clinical Cases and Updates. The audience is yours, Professor. So, can you see the slide now? So, thank you very much yes. for this um, uh, kind uh, introduction and also to invite me to this meeting and uh, I was actually very honored to be invited and to give this speak uh, uh, to meet you and also to have the speak on um, incretin therapy and uh, DPP-4 which has been the focus of my research for many decades. Uh, so what I will do in this talk is that I will give a brief background on the uh, on the history of um, um, uh, uh, DPP-4 and uh, uh, incretin therapy. And then I will discuss uh, five different uh, clinical cases where DPP-4 or GLP-1 may be involved as treatment. And then I will discuss three novel excited stories and uh, studies on uh, DPP-4. And then I will end with some aspects on COVID-19 and diabetes. But here is some as uh, uh, Dr. Sami mentioned, I am uh, from Lund University in Sweden. I was before the Dean of Faculty of Medicine, now I am the pro Vice of the University. And I've been working uh, with uh, incretin therapy since, at, actually since it started with the first studies on GLP-1 and DPP-4. And then until I became the pro Vice chancellor I worked also with many of the companies involved in the development of this uh, interesting class of substance. What is excited about this uh, uh, incretin therapy in DPP-4 is that they target the pathophysiology of type 2 diabetes. So you can say that this is a type of treatment that can treat the cause of the disease. And there is a brief background that we have certain background to diabetes, uh, like genetic background, obesity, and other factors, and they cause insulin resistance. 
And uh, if the sub subject with insulin resistance has a complete normal islet, uh, which most of uh, the subjects have, then there is an islet adaptation, increasing insulin, reducing glucagon, and the, the subject will remain with normal glucose tolerance. But if there is an islet dysfunction, there will be an abnormal adaptation to the insulin resistance and the insulin will be insufficient. So it's lower than what is needed for the insulin resistance. And at the same time, the glucagon is not suppressed. So the glucagon levels will be too much. And therefore to treat diabetes, you need to raise the insulin and you need to reduce uh, uh, the glucagon. And that is exactly what GLP-1 is doing. And we found that in our very first study, which was uh, performed by, uh, in the en end of the 80s, actually, so it's more than 30 years ago, where we infused GLP-1, which is the incretin hormone released from the gut every time we eat. And we found that uh, GLP-1 could reduce glucose, increase insulin, and reduce glucagon. And we presented this at the ASD in 1990 and presented this as the new treatment of type 2 diabetes. And that was published two years later in the New England Journal of Medicine. And in that issue in uh, New England Journal of Medicine, the editors, they wrote an editorial saying that if someone can reproduce these interesting findings on GLP-1, then we will have a new treatment for type 2 diabetes. So that was actually the start of this field. And what was very excited for many was that for the first time we had a potential therapy of type 2 diabetes, which is based on physiology, since GLP-1 is a physiological hormone, an incretin hormone. And at the same time, it targets the pathophysiology of type 2 diabetes. So it's both come from physiology and it uh, treats the disease. The problem in the beginning was that we cannot use GLP-1 because it's degraded by DPP-4. And if you inject GLP-1, as was performed here in a study showing the plasma levels of GLP-1 after injection, it, it's, it's cleared from the blood within a few minutes because DPP-4 cleaves and degrades uh, GLP-1. And it does so by removing the two amino acids from the N-terminal end of GLP-1. So this is the uh, structure of GLP-1 and DPP-4 removes those two N-terminal amino acids and then GLP-1 become inactive and therefore uh, you cannot use GLP-1 as such for treatment because DPP-4 DPP is very efficient. And therefore from that time there was the idea to develop incretin therapy by using this knowledge of the effect of GLP-1 uh, but uh, but um, uh, uh, instead doing it by producing DPP4-resistant GLP-1 receptor agonists or inhibit the enzyme DPP4, which then would prevent the deg degradation of GLP-1 and therefore raise the endogenous concentration of uh, the hormone. And for those of you who are interested in biochemistry, I just wanted to show here how DPP-4 looks like. You see here, uh, uh, to the left in the bottom you see the cell, the endothelial cells, and in all endothelial cells in the, uh, all over the body, DPP-4 is uh, attached to the cell. But the main part of DPP-4 is a long end which protrudes into the plasma. And the catalytic site which degrades GLP-1 is here at the number, amino acid number 630, and that's very far to the C-terminal end. And under in vivo conditions, DPP-4 exists as a dimer, so there are two DPP-4 molecules sitting together, and they sit together such that they will form a, a small pocket uh, of the C-terminal ends, and in this pocket, we have this high catalytic activity in activating GLP-1. So every time GLP-1 passes by in the bloodstream, it enters this pocket and gets degraded. And therefore our idea from the beginning was to produce molecules which can enter the pocket and thereby preventing GLP-1 from entering it. And therefore GLP-1 itself will stay in the plasma as an active substance. And that was, um, succeeded by the nine, end of 90s that uh, so, some of those product uh, compounds were produced and uh, 
by the end of 90s, we performed the very first study on DPP-4 inhibition in diabetic patients. It was a prototype of a DPP-4 inhibitor called DPP-7 to 8, and that was given to patients for four weeks, and there was a clear reduction in A1C after those four weeks, although the study was not, uh, only four weeks. And that was the evidence that DPP-4 inhibition can be a clinical compound for uh, treatment of glycemia. And I presented that at the ADA in 2001, and it was um, uh, published in 2004. So you can say in one sense, this started the whole history of the DPP-4. And later studies showed that DPP-4 inhibition actually had the same effects as TLP-1. And we showed that in a study from 2004 using vildagliptin, where we found that after four weeks of treatment, uh, vilagliptin had reduced glycemia. This is um, the glucose levels after a test meal, a breakfast. You see after 120 minutes that vilagliptin clearly suppressed glycemia. At the same time, to the right top, we have GLP-1. And you can see that the GLP-1 levels are raised by vilagliptin. And to the right bottom, we have the glucagon levels. You can see that GLP-1 reduces glucagon. Uh, vilagliptin reduces glucagon. So that means that DPP-4 inhibition has all those good effects that we can see from, uh, from um, GLP-1. But the main interest and the actual trigger of DPP-4 in the development was this study where we followed patients give, uh, with, treated with vilagliptin together with metformin versus metformin alone for one year, and you can see the A1C levels, that it was a dramatic effect to suppress A1C with vildagliptin, and that was published in 2004, and that was the actual start of the clinical interest to use um, uh, DPP-4 inhibition. And uh, last year I was uh, invited to write the history of DPP-4 inhibition. I call that DPP-4 inhibition and the path to clinical proof, and that was uh, published in Frontier Endocrinology. Now you can see the main phases of it. It started by our study in 1990, and then it was basic studies, development of DPP-4 inhibitors, animal studies, human studies, and then phase three studies. And around 2005 to 10, it was the first approvals for treatment. And then it slowly entered the clinical practice from 2010 and onwards. And then now the recent years, we have had the cardiovascular outcome trials. And throughout all these years, we have the mechanistic studies to understand this important and interesting compound. So now we have for incretin therapy, we have the DPP-4 inhibitors. They are oral. They have a low risk for hypoglycemia, neutral body weight, very little adverse events. And we have the GLP-1 receptor agonists, which uh, uh, we inject subcutaneously and they uh, are all DPP-4 resistant, so they directly in, uh, activate the receptors. Also a low risk for hypoglycemia, body weight reduction, and some adverse events in the beginning uh, of, with uh, vomiting and um, uh, nausea. So what is especially exciting is that DPP-4 inhibitors, they target the main pathophysiology of type 2 diabetes. So it's a, it's a treatment which can correct the pathophysiology. They have good effects and what is very important, a very low risk for hypoglycemia. They are body weight neutral, so they um, prevent weight gain and some studies have shown that they actually slightly reduce body weight. They are cardiovascular safe, uh, as has been shown in uh, many of the cardiovascular outcome trials. It's also known that they are renal for safety from a renal point of view and therefore can be used also in kidney insufficiency. And overall, very little uh, risk of adverse events. And they can be used in a number of situations from monotherapy through combinations and also in special uh, populations such as pa patients with cardiovascular disease, elderly, fragile patients and so on. And what is also very important uh, is that they are oral and very easy to take in the dosage. And so, so they are a friendly, uh, user-friendly type of treatment. So that was my introduction uh, to, to put the stage for DPP-4 inhibition, which I think then is a very excited treatment uh, uh, of those reasons that it's good, simple, and also that it corrects the pathophysiology. 
So I will now present for you some cases which I have had recently and um, uh, in whom uh, we have discussed uh, should DPP4 inhibitors be used here or uh, how is the relation between choice of DPP4 inhibition with other agents. And the first case is a woman born in uh, uh, 77. Uh, she had uh, some um, family history since her mother uh, was, uh, is obese, has type 2 diabetes, and uh, the mother is treated with metformin. Uh, she is living a healthy, active life, has two children, and works as a cashier in a supermarket. And she came for the first time to, um, to uh, treatment in uh, February 2018. She was 48, uh, 41 years of age then. And then she was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, healthy from before. A1C was 7.9, she had a normal BMI, blood pressure, blood lipids normal, and the clinician said that uh, now we start with lifestyle changes. And she came back three months later in May, and then A1C had uh, raised to 8.1, and therefore they started with metformin. Uh, she had metformin uh, and uh, came back to a next visit in uh, November, and then A1C had got down to 7.1, which is uh, of course a good effect, but not sufficient. And uh, metformin was well tolerated, so the dose was increased. And also that higher dose was tolerated. And uh, she came back one year later. And there she came to us then with an A1C had now gone up to 7.5, so higher than before. Body weight had increased uh, about one kilo and the BMI was also higher. Now she had a blood pressure was 140, 75, blood lipids still normal. She had an EGFR of 79 and no complications for the disease. So we have here a, a case with a 42 year old woman with two years history of metformin treated diabetes with no complications, but with glycemic control above the target. So what to do with that case? Um, for the uh, choices uh, we have that first we want to start blood pressure treatment since uh, the uh, blood pressure was above the target and then we need of course to intensify the glucose uh, lowering therapy uh, and um, uh, keep metformin that was um, uh, well tolerated but uh, we need to add something else. And what, uh, then we discussed also with the patient what, what to add to this. And uh, here is what we have as a choice. We have sulfonylureas, we have TCD, GLP-1s, DPP-4, SGLT-2s, and insulin. And here is some impression we have that A1C go down, body weight for some increase, for some uh, lowering. Hypoglycemia risk, uh, different. Uh, adverse events, also different. And administration, some subcutaneous, some oral. And based on this, when discussing with the patient, she didn't want to have insulin, uh, and um, um, uh, she did um, um, want to test uh, um, no injection. She heard about the adverse events of SGLT2, and therefore she wanted to know more about the DPP4 or sulfonylurea. And there is a study we did, uh, published already 2009, which was a huge study with more than 1,000 patients in each arm, where we compared the sulfonylurea with DPP-4. And that was vilagliptin together versus glimepiride. And that was um, uh, together with metformin. And you see one year study, A1C went down around the same, but body weight, a huge increase, slight reduction with DPP-4 inhibition, but a slight increase with sulfonylurea. But the main difference, of course, the hypoglycemia, uh, that we saw very few hypoglycemia with bildagliptin, but with sulfonylurea, huge number of hypoglycemia in this patient uh, uh, population. So just by seeing this, the patient said that she wanted to try the DPP-4 because it's oral, it has this low risk of hypoglycemia, there is no weight gain, might be a weight reduction, or other adverse events. And therefore, she, that was added, vilagliptin, 50 milligram BID, and she came back uh, uh, um, later, and then A1C had gone down, and um, uh, she uh, had normal lipids, normal blood pressure, 
and the advice then was to continue with metformin and DPP-4 with a new visit after uh, six months. So that was a case showing that uh, DPP-4 is efficient in combination with metformin and is preferred before sulfonylurea to avoid hyperglycemia. And when we presented those studies um, like 10 years ago, this was um, against the dogma in, in many guidelines. Now this has come becoming more and more uh, important and uh, accepted that uh, uh, DPP-4 is before sulfonylurea to avoid uh, hypoglycemia when you add on this to metformin. And that can be seen also in, in uh, under special conditions like in Ramadan when there are two very important studies. One, the Virtue study uh, from 2013, which is a study uh, comparing during vildagliptin, uh, during Ramadan, comparing vildagliptin with sulfonylurea during uh, Ramadan. And uh, it was a study performed in uh, 10 different countries all over the world. And uh, uh, the idea was to uh, test vildagliptin plus metformin or vildagliptin monotherapy versus sulfonylurea plus metformin or sulfonylurea monotherapy. And you can see that there were many patients in this study, 600 in each arm. And the study was for 16 weeks, uh, including the fasting period for four weeks. And um, this study has a lot of interesting information in it, but what can be seen here is the mo most important, and that is the hypoglycemic events. And to the left, you can see how many of those patients experienced hypoglycemia at least once uh, during the fasting period. And it was uh, 36 patients of the 669 with vilagliptin. But for, for the sulfonylurea, it was 123 patients out of the 621. And if, uh, when calculating the severe uh, hypoglycemia, which, which we sometimes call grade two, which is a case where you need um, uh, um, uh, help from another person for during the hypoglycemia, then there was not a single case with villagliptin, but four with sulfonylurea. And then to the right, you can see the A1C, which went down uh, 0.24 by villagliptin, and no change by sulfonylurea. So there was also a difference there. But the main difference was this huge difference in, uh, in um, uh, hypoglycemia in favor of um, 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 uh, Vildagliptin. Uh, the other study uh, was uh, performed by Dr. Hassanain in um, UK and it was the vector study comparing uh, Vildagliptin versus uh, glycoside, the sulfonylurea, in combination with metformin during fast, uh, fasting during Ramadan. And the um, study was also uh, 16 weeks, six weeks before, six weeks after, and then the fasting period, metformin plus bildagliptin versus metformin plus glycoside. And the results was, um, were very similar to the other. So uh, that um, to the left, you can see the number of hypoglycemic events. So this is the number of events, which then can be more than one in each patient. But in bildagliptin, there was not a single hypoglycemic event, whereas for glycoside, there were 34 events in those 36 patients. And there was also, which you can see here in the middle, one patient having a severe hypoglycemia with glycoside, but not none with vilagliptin. And A1C, similar as before, reduction by vilagliptin and uh, no change or slight increase actually for, for uh, sulfonylurea. So it's very clear that by comparing those uh, two classes uh, of drugs, there is an advantage of um, uh, DPP-4. And you can discuss why is there such a low uh, hypoglycemia uh, risk with uh, incretin-based medications. Uh, so actually this is the preferred um, uh, treatment if you want to avoid hypoglycemia. And uh, there are two reasons for this. And one reason is that the effect of GLP-1 is glucose dependent. So that when the glucose drops, there is not, no more any stimulation of insulin secretion. And therefore that is a self-defense against hypoglycemia. 
But there is also another uh, mechanism for DPP4 inhibition, which is quite unique. Uh, and that is um, uh, that uh, DPP4 inhibition does not only prevent the degradation of the incretin hormone GLP1, but also it prevents the degradation of the other incretin hormone GIP. And here you can see the effects of GLP-1 and GIP if glucose comes below 4 or 4.5 millimolar. And that is that uh, both GLP-1 and GIP stop producing insulin because they, they have glucose dependent effect. But on top of that, glucagon is stimulated by uh, GIP at low glucose. So that means that there is a self-defensive mechanism by DPP-4 to avoid uh, hypoglycemia as uh, you have injected glucagon. There is an increase in glucagon by GIP, which is then increased by DPP-4. So then I come to the second uh, case, and that is also a woman born 72. Uh, she had um, also family history. Her father had type 2 diabetes. Uh, and um, uh, died also after a myocardial infarction, married, two grown-up children, healthy until 2018 when she was 46 years. And then she had quite severe symptoms of diabetes. Frequent urination thirst came to the clinic with an A1C of 9.5%, BMI 25, and they started metformin directly. She came back in July, then metformin was well tolerated, uh, but A1C hadn't uh, changed too much, and then glimepiride was added. Then she came back the year after, and A1C had gone down to 8.5. The body weight had increased to 3, BMI 26, and then they increased the dose of, of uh, glimepiride. And then in December last year, she came with a hi severe hypoglycemia. Uh, and then they, um, uh, of course, removed sulfonylurea, but kept uh, uh, the metformin. And now she came to us uh, a month ago with an A1C, 7.8. She had experienced hypoglycemia. She was on metformin only. Weight had now been reduced, 1.5 kilo after removal of sulfonylurea, BMI 25. And if you see of the list, she had a quite normal um, uh, kidney function. Um, and uh, blood pressure was uh, slightly elevated. Cholesterol, uh, LDL cholesterol high, HDL low, triglyceride a bit high, so there was a lipid dyslipidemia. She had also some retinopathy, but no signs of cardiovascular symptoms. So this is a 48-year-old woman with a type 2 uh, diabetes for a two years history, and uh, she had also history of sulfonylurea, uh, um, um, uh, induced hypoglycemia, treated with metformin, and some complications. So what to do now? She had an A1C of 7.8. Now we need to treat the hypertension, dyslipidemia, and we also need to add something else to this. And this is a patient who had had hypoglycemia, so then of course sulfonylurea is not good. So what do we then have? Um, and uh, she was a bit more advanced. So we selected between GLP-1s, DPP-4, or SGLT-2. Uh, insulin, she was not so interested in insulin at that stage. But that was the three um, uh, choices we discussed with her. And then first, you can discuss, compare DPP-4 with SGLT-2. They both reduce A1C. Uh, there is uh, low risk for hypoglycemia. They are oral, so they are user-friendly. Uh, but there is a difference with adverse events where SGLT2 have adverse events, especially in women with genital infection and also uh, risk for fractures and uh, um, other adverse events. And even before, they have no, no such adverse events. GLP1s, they are uh, uh, injectables. Uh, and uh, uh, reduce body weight. And um, when comparing this, you can see there are actually six studies, head-to-head -head studies, comparing DPP-4 versus SGLT2. And these studies uh, are shown here on the, uh, related to the A1C. And uh, the black curve is um, DPP-4 inhibitor, the red is SGLT2 inhibitor at a low dose, 
and the blue at a high dose. And you can see when this treatment started and then there was different lengths, 12 and 26 weeks. And you can see all those three regimens reduced A1C, but it looks around the same. And there was actually a meta-analysis performed by Dr. Shein, which is in press now, uh, but you can read it online where he compared this in a strict meta-analysis study showing that uh, they, they have exactly the same uh, efficacy to reduce A1C around minus 0.8%. So you can see from an efficacy point of view, DPP4 and SDLT2 uh, are the same. For when you compare DPP4 versus GLP-1, there are some head-to-head uh, -head study, and we did one study comparing semaglutide, which is a GLP-1 receptor agonist, versus citagliptin. And here you can see to the left A1C that when you compare DPP-4 and GLP-1, usually the GLP-1s have a stronger effect to reduce A1C, and also a stronger effect to reduce body weight. And when you discuss this with the patient, those uh, different studies, uh, you can say that A1C, then DPP4, SGLT2 the same, GLP1 a little higher effect, hypoglycemia risk uh, the same, uh, adverse events, yes for SGLT2, no for DPP4, and slight for uh, GLP1. Uh, the adverse event is mainly in the beginning, nausea, vomiting, usually during the first 12 or, uh, weeks, and then a different administration. Um, and the patient uh, then um, uh, wanted to use uh, DPP-4 because it was oral, because it had a good profile, and because um, it has such a low risk for uh, not only hypoglycemia, which she had experienced badly with saturnaluria, but also less adverse events than SGLP-2. So this was also a case where we added Villagliptin with a new visit after six months. So DPP-4 is efficient in combination with metformin, has lower degrees of adverse events than SGLT2 and is oral. The third case uh, where we discussed um, uh, DPP-4 was a woman born 1940, so she is older. She had also some history. Her father died of stroke, high blood pressure, and mother died of heart failure. She is a widow. And she was fairly healthy, except well-treated blood pressure since 2010. She had diabetes in 2015, uh, and then it was 8.5% when it was started, and EGFR was 65. She was given lifestyle advices, uh, but the year after, still A1C was 8.4. Now she was 76 years old, started with metformin. She came back the year after. She had some uh, abdominal discomfort and uh, was not feeling well. So metformin dose was reduced, but A1C was still elevated, 8.4, and then glimepiride was added. And then uh, she came now in 2020, A1C was still high, 8.7%. She experienced tiredness, slight loss of me uh, uh, memory, and also uh, had had uh, some uh, small events of uh, hypoglycemia. So we have here an 80-year-old uh, woman with a five-year history of type 2 diabetes, no complications, but with insufficient glycemic control. So what to do with uh, um, uh, these elderly patients? And then we need to consider aspects of diabetes in the elderly. And we need to define a target. And for this patient, 7.5% uh, could be a good target or 7%, but not to go down to a lower. And we need to replace the sulfonylurea because this uh, slight loss of memory, small uh, episodes of hypoglycemia, that could well be because of the sulfonylurea. Here is a list of different aspects that is important to um, uh, consider in the elderly. For drug naive patients, it's important to restrict the use of metformin because there is a usually declining renal function in elderly. When we think of add-on therapy, we should think of the risk for polypharmacy, risk of drug-to-drug -drug interaction, sulfonylurea, risk for hypoglycemia, which is especially important in the elderly. TCD could cause fluid retention. SGLT2 could cause risk for dehydration and fractures and therefore be more restricted use in the elderly. 
and uh, insulin. Of course, that could be good, but the insulin clearance is affected by renal impairment, and therefore it might be more difficult to dose the insulin. Hypoglycemia, of course, is severe for um, elderly patients, causing also uh, other symptoms of hypoglycemia, like loss of memory, faults, exactly. Uh, renal impairment uh, uh, is uh, more important in the or common in the elderly, and there is also other aspects. So it's very important to think of that the elderly needs some other uh, thoughts than other patients, other targets, and also other treatments. And here is one study showing that EPP4 may be a very good choice in the elderly. It's a study uh, in patients above 75 years for 12 weeks and uh, it started with a baseline of 8.5% uh, and that went down actually 1.1% with bilagliptin which is a very, very good effect in this uh, study. Body weight slightly reduced but what is more most important is that this reduction in A1C in these very elderly patients uh, was seen without any uh, single hypoglycemic events. So therefore in these patients um, we replaced the sulfonylurea with DPP-4 uh, and uh, the um, message is that uh, DPP-4 has several advantages in the elderly patients and can replace many of the other therapies. Case 4 is a man born 55, father died in old age by stroke, uh, mother died uh, from kidney disease, so she, he has also some family history. Um, retired office worker, was a previous smoker, and uh, hypertension in 2002, and dyslipidemia diagnosed in 2004, treated with uh, angiotensin receptor blockade and statins. And uh, the diabetes was um, diagnosed in 2017, March, 62 years of age. A1C was 7.2, and they started immediately with metformin, titrated up to 2 gram. Uh, and then he came back a year later, still A1C was elevated, 7.8%. Now BMI had increased to 28. Uh, he had uh, signs of retinopathy and, which is important, EGFR had gone down to 45. Uh, they reduced the dose of metformin because of this EGFR and they added uh, glimepiride, which was titrated up to 6 mg daily. And that was successful in terms of A1C, uh, since uh, A1C was reduced to 7.2%. Uh, and um, uh, but uh, he experienced several issues of hypoglycemia um, um, during January to May uh, 2019, and uh, body weight increased. So that was thought of then a uh, side effects of the hypoglycemia. Uh, he came to us in June last year, 8.4%, and then EGFR had gone down to 34, blood pressure and lipids still uh, controlled. So here we had a 62-year-old uh, man, two years history of type 2 diabetes, insufficient glycemic control, retinopathy, nephropathy, and um, uh, history of repeated hypoglycemic episodes and treated with metformin and sulfonylurea. So what to do here? Here it's important to consider that this is a patient starting to have a kidney dysfunction. And we need to reduce the dose of metformin. We need to remove the sulfonylurea. We need to intensify treatment with something which avoids hypoglycemia and also is safe from a kidney point of view. So therefore, incretin therapy is possible. SGLT2 inhibition not recommended because of the low EGFR and therefore it was selected after discussion with the patient to use a DPP-4 inhibitor with a new visit after uh, six months. And here is an example of why this could be a very good choice. It's a study in kidney uh, renal impaired subjects. Um, to the left, patients having moderate renal impairments between 31 and 60 milliliter per minute and uh, to the right, those with severe renal impairment. And bilagliptin was added to those patients, and uh, the A1C from the beginning was around 7.8%, and there was a reduction in A1C compared to 
the placebo, which was significant. Uh, and uh, there was no change in EGFR, so it was completely safe for the renal function. What was important here is that bilagliptin dose in the renal impairment is 50 milligram times one. So therefore, this could be a very good choice of the patients with renal impairment. So what was done was then that uh, uh, DP before was added and um, uh, um, the patient was asked to return after six months and he did. And then A1C was 7.6, EGFR 36. So what to do now? Um, A1C had gone down not only to 7.6. We need to have it lower. EGFR is still lower and uh, what to add then to DPP4, then it's important to consider adding insulin. And to add insulin to DPP4 is a, is a very good combination because insulin and incretin therapy have synergistic actions if you think of the different mechanisms of insulin and incretin. And I wrote an article some years ago in the World Journal of Diabetes saying that insulin plus incretin is a good glucose lowering strategy in type 2 diabetes when you come to the stage that you need something to add to the DPV4. And if you think of insulin, it improves glucose utilization in muscle and fat tissue, which reduces fasting glucose. And DPV4 inhibition reduces glucagon, postprandial glucose, diminishes risk for hypoglycemia, prevents weight gain. And you can see the different mechanisms here that the incretin affects uh, the eyelids, it affects the gut, uh, and the liver, insulin affects liver, fat tissue, and muscle. So they have a synergistic complementary action, and therefore that could be used together. And so you add insulin to this uh, subject with treated with metformin with uh, bildagliptin. And just recently <laughs> published online last week, there was a very interesting article which uh, has had a, a lot of interest uh, in also in the media that um, uh, patients on insulin, they have an increased oxidization in their uh, vessels. So the oxidative stress is increased by insulin. To the left here, uh, uh, these studies shows two different methods of measuring oxidative stress. To the left is uh, uh, the baseline, the second column is after insulin. It increases the oxidative stress and in patients having insulin plus DPP4, you can see that it prevents the oxidative stress. So not only by thinking of the, uh, of the glycemia, but also thinking of uh, the oxidative stress, it's a very good uh, choice to have these two together. So in this case, patient, the, uh, we added insulin to the patient. So DPP4 can be used in kidney failure, and it's rational for also combining with insulin is the take home message from this patient. <coughs> then the final case I want um, to discuss is a man born 62, father died on heart attack, mother still alive, university professor diagnosed with diabetes in 2008, he was 46 years then. He was initially treated with sulfonylurea but had hypoglycemia and therefore it was changed to metformin. He has hypertension, dyslipidemia, and came to us after he had the myocardial infarction in November 2018. He survived that infarction and um, A1C was when he came 8.4. He was then treated with metformin. He had EGFR of 45s uh, and blood pressure was well controlled. So we have a um, 56 year old man with 12 years history of type 2 diabetes, 10 years history of uh, uh, hypertension, also dyslipidemia, now myocardial infarction, evidence for nephropathy and retinopathy. So what to do here? We are here, we need to intensify glucose lowering therapy. We need to improve cardiovascular outcome with renal protection at the same time, low risk for hypoglycemia. So if we now think of what we have here, we could uh, select uh, <coughs> GLP-1s, we could select DPP-4, we could select uh, STLT2. And uh, if you think of uh, the cardiovascular outcome trials, DPP4 inhibition has been shown to be completely safe in cardiovascular outcome trials uh, and can be used in renal failure. So this is an option for this patient. 
GLP-1 receptor agonists, they have been shown to have benefit in cardiovascular outcomes and also in the common guidelines recommending atherosclerotic disease and can, can be used in renal failure down to EGFR of 30. SGLT2 also cardiovascular benefits and recommended in heart failure, but not recommended when EGFR is too low. So therefore, from this point of view, uh, in this patient, uh, GLP-1 could be a very good uh, choice or DPP-4. When thinking of those cardiovascular outcome trials, it's very important that these trials uh, are, um, have used a selected type of patients. And there was recent um, um, discussion that uh, only around 10 to 20% of patients which we see or elig were eligible for inclusion in the cardiovascular outcome trials. So therefore, uh, to draw conclusions from the trials to all patients could be um, uh, mislead the general or the generalization of it. Uh, and you need to judge it from uh, the special patient groups, including in the cardiovascular outcome trials. GLP-1 has special effects on cardiovascular effects. Uh, it um, lowers the hyperglycemia, it lowers body weight, it has direct effect on the myocardial injury, it improves dyslipidemia, lowers blood pressure, and improves endothelial dysfunction. So in this patient, uh, GLP-1 receptor agonist was selected because of its experience in cardiovascular outcome trials, because of its effects in other um, uh, uh, studies with uh, cardiovascular diseases, it's an effect on uh, body weight and A1C. And he came back then uh, with A1C of 7.2%, so still not good, but better than before. And then we added insulin because of this synergy between the in, uh, GLP-1 and insulin. So GLP-1 receptor agonist has advantage in atherosclerotic disease, but the PP4 is also an option, especially if EGFR is lower. So now if we conclude <coughs> DPP-4 inhibition, my experience is that you can use it as add-on to metformin. It, it is as efficient as others, as efficient as SGLT2 and sulfonylurea. GLP-1 receptor agonist may be a little more efficient. There is a low risk of hypoglycemia and other adverse events. It's safe, it's oral, it can be used in monotherapy in combination with insulin, in the elderly, in kidney disease, and it's also proven safe in cardiovascular disease. So therefore I am from, since I was from the beginning of this, uh, doing the first study, it's very excited to see that uh, the promises we had for the DPP4 uh, group has really come true when you see uh, the effect compared to other therapies. <clears throat> what I will now know, do, do is to present some new exciting studies uh, and I selected three studies which show further evidence of DPP-4 inhibition. The first study is what uh, the study called VERIFY which was published last year and uh, disclosed at the ESD uh, last year. It was a study on the long-term effect on initial combination of metformin plus vildagliptin. It was newly diagnosed patients, a huge study, 2,000 patients, five-year study, and it compared uh, bilagliptin uh, plus metformin versus metformin monotherapy. And the underlying question was, can bilagliptin and metformin be used already from the start of uh, the disease? And the um, design was that the um, patient um, had a uh, study initiation and then uh, they titrated up metformin and then they were divided into arms, one metformin plus bildagliptin and one metformin plus placebo. And they, uh, the idea was to follow the patients until they fail this therapy. And the failure was said to be 7%. So when the, uh, the patient reached 7%, something was added and that was uh, to continue with metformin, increase the dose with vildagliptin or add vildagliptin to the metformin arm. And then patients were followed to see when do they fail the second time after this combination and then insulin was added. So there were two questions, the first time to initial failure and then time to secondary failure. And there is a result on the time to initial failure. And uh, in uh, blue, you can see the 
med två med plastfyllda grip till att it could completely suppress the deterioration of the disease and, uh, and prolong the time until it fails. Actually, when you compare um, when 50% of the patients have failed and need something else, that was in the initial monotherapy with metformin after 36 months. But if you use metformin plus bildagriptin, it was until five years, actually after the study end, 61 months. So you can really prolong uh, the, uh, the disease uh, uh, deterioration with this combination. And it was the same to see to the second failure when the patient needed insulin. There was also a clear uh, prolongation of this phase with the initial combination. So therefore the conclusion was that early combination with bilagliptin and um, uh, metformin uh, can provide durable effects uh, uh, in, uh, when starting uh, from the beginning. The second study is a study we did, so which is published this year, when we have studied the persistency of DPP-4 inhibition throughout the day. Because it's important not only to study A1C, but to see the full day glucose uh, uh, reduction. And very few studies have documented where the glucose lowering medication uh, cover the entire day and most clinical studies do not measure glucose apart from fasting and mechanistic studies mainly study effects of breakfast. So we studied the 24 hour coverage of metformin alone and metformin plus DPV4 inhibition and we did that in a study with patients 63 years of age, four years uh, duration and uh, here is the main result where you can see to the left uh, upper panel the glucose levels. In black, metformin alone, in uh, red with bilagliptin. You can see that it really reduces glucose after breakfast, after lunch, after dinner. And if you see to the right, you see the GLP-1 levels and they are elevated throughout the day. So you have a constant elevation up to around 20 picomolar of GLP-1. And to the right you, uh, below, you can see glucagon, which was suppressed. So the conclusion here is that there is really a persistent effect of bilagliptin throughout the day when you give it uh, to patients uh, as add-on to metformin. And the third study is a study we need to compare GSLT2 and DPP4 on glucagon. <clears throat> Because as I said in the beginning, glucagon is a very important uh, factor to drive the hypoglycemia. You have high glucagon uh, in type 2 diabetes and therefore reducing glucagon is an important aspect of diabetes treatment. And DPV4 inhibition has been shown to reduce glucagon, but SGLT2 has been shown to increase glucagon. And therefore it's important to compare this in a head-to-head -head study. So we did this in a study when we uh, had patients on metformin, they were 63 years of age, they had A1C of 6.8%, so fairly well controlled. And uh, it was a crossover design, so they started either villagliptin or dapagliflozin, and then they were switched uh, and, uh, to a second series when they used the other. So therefore, uh, it was a real crossover design, and you can compare each individual patient with uh, uh, the patient it's, uh, himself. And here you can see the result. Um, to the left um, uh, up you see the glucose levels, they were the same and that fits the previous finding I said that they are fairly efficient in reducing glucose. But to the right up you can see glucagon and glucagon was clearly reduced by villagliptin and it was higher after dapagliflozin. So there is a clear discrepancy in the effect on glucagon uh, when you compare DPP-4 and SDLT2. So now the few minutes left, I will say a few words on COVID-19 and type 2 diabetes. And that COVID-19, as you know, has uh, uh, hit us all. We have very many cases in Sweden and um, uh, also we have seen a lot of cases with diabetes and therefore uh, it's important to consider how to treat the diabetes in COVID-19 and also uh, what could be the mechanism, why are patients with uh, uh, diabetes especially vulnerable for COVID-19. And um, um, there are some studies uh, coming out now, but uh, 
still uh, COVID-19 has been going on uh, not so long time. So therefore we have not so many studies and we have some studies which are not very uh, fairly well done uh, because uh, people are wanted to publish very early and uh, uh, therefore some of the information needs really to be reconsidered in more long-term studies. But something can be said already and one thing is that diabetes is a clear risk factor for COVID-19 but it's less important than high age and hypertension. Uh, so in patients with high age it's mainly the age and if they have hypertension that increases the risk. And therefore you can say that diabetes is a more stronger risk factor in younger patients who have not this age as a risk. On the other hand also, patients with diabetes have more severe COVID-19. So it's a risk factor not only of getting COVID-19, but also of having the severe form. Uh, and that can be studied by counting numbers in intensive care units, counting patients who survive. And the, there are more patients in intensive care units with diabetes and also non-survivors are less uh, are higher with diabetes in many studies. And why? How could that be that diabetes is such a risk for COVID-19? And there are two mechanisms which have been discussed. One mechanism relates to two proteins, one called ACE2 uh, and the other furin. These two proteins are important for the entry of the coronavirus into the cells. And it has been shown that diabetes increases the expression of these two proteins. And therefore, patients with diabetes, especially with high glucose, so it's related to glucose also, have a higher ACE2 and furin, and therefore more COVID, uh, coronavirus enter the cell. And then there is the other aspect, and that is that high glucose impairs T cell function. And T cell function uh, is probably very important to defend COVID-19. Here is just a cartoon showing this, uh, that you can see the, the uh, um, coronavirus on the top uh, uh, at, uh, come and uh, attach to the cell through ACE2. And then when it enters the cell, it's done by this protein called furin. And that is uh, why there could be an increased risk with diabetes uh, of the disease. So what about the different glucose lowering agents in COVID? Uh, there, there, uh, more and more clinical information is now gathered. And I wrote here some, uh, in, uh, some review article on this, but it comes almost every day. There are new more information. Metformin uh, um, has been a problem in COVID-19. It said that metformin can increase further the expression of AC2 and also uh, patients with vomiting, poor oral intake with COVID-19, then metformin has to be removed. TCD uh, uh, has, uh, increases the risk of pneumonia when you have COVID-19, and there is also an increased expression of AC2. SGLT2 inhibitors are advised not to use because of the risk for dehydration and ketosis, uh, and therefore that could uh, um, further cause deterioration of patients with COVID-19. For DPP-4, there are some very interesting aspects. And one is that um, uh, um, the coronavirus in MERS uh, enter the cells through DPP-4, which is a very interesting aspect of DPP-4. So the receptor for MERS uh, uh, coronavirus is through DPP-4. And certain DPP-4 polymorphism protects from, uh, uh, from DPP-4 polymer protects from uh, MERS. So therefore, DPP-4 has a clear connection to uh, MERS coronavirus. Uh, and uh, on top of that, DPP-4 has been shown to modulate inflammation and exert antifibrotic activity which could uh, cause uh, an improvement of the hyperinflammatory state associated with severe COVID-19. Um, and therefore it's been uh, now studied whether there is also a connection between uh, COVID-19 and DPP-4. And it has been shown that it's completely safe to use DPP-4 in COVID-19. 
uh, but it could also be suggested that that could perhaps be the preferred orbit therapy. And there was recently a very interesting article in Diabetes Research Clinical Practice saying that COVID-19 and diabetes can be put before inhibition play a role. Um, to, <coughs> to make some sort of guidelines for COVID-19, an international panel with like 20 different international experts were formed and uh, they published their suggestion uh, on April 23rd, so just a few weeks ago, in Lancet Diabetes Endocrinology. And that article uh, has Bornstein as the first name and it's online. And what they now suggest, so this is an international panel suggesting, uh, based on the experience we have now, that for metformin, dehydration and lactic acidosis will probably occur if patients have, uh, are dehydrated. So therefore, the advice is, is that patients with COVID-19 should stop taking these drugs. SGLT2 inhibitors, there is risk of dehydration and ketoacidosis, and therefore it's advised to stop taking SGLT2. For GLP-1 receptor agonists, they say that uh, they can cause nausea and vomiting during the initiation, so therefore uh, patients um, should not start treatment on GLP-1 if they have COVID-19. But DPP-4 inhibition are safe and well tolerated and can be continued in COVID-19. And insulin, of course, therapy should not be stopped, but treatment carefully dosed. So this is like the latest international. Then, of course, there are other <coughs> aspects of COVID-19 and diabetes, especially in times of lockdown. We have possibility exercise is limited. There is many stress. Daily routine on food intake is altered. Difficulties in obtaining medicine and other, other aspects. So there is a lot of aspects for COVID-19 in general in diabetes, and it will probably become much more information later on. So what I have done in this talk is that I discuss with you the history and uh, the background on DPP-4 and uh, showing that I'm very excited on both the background and how it has developed. Then I presented five cases uh, illustrating add-on to metforming, hypoglycemia, elderly, kidney disease, heart failure. I discussed three studies, one showing that there is good to have initial combination, bilagliptin and metformin, whole day persistency in glucose redu reduction with uh, bilagliptin, and also comparing DPP-4 versus SGLT2 on glucagon. And then finally, I had some aspects on COVID-19 and diabetes uh, with special uh, uh, focus on uh, DPP-4. So thank you very much for your interest. Uh, uh, and um, also thank you for uh, giving the opportunity to give this talk. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Aaron, for a, a wonderful uh, and uh, comprehensive talk about uh, DPP-4 and Vildagliptin in, uh, in particular. Uh, we have some questions. Uh, yeah. Some of them were uh, were sent during your talk, so you actually responded to some of them. Okay. Uh, do you prefer the first question? Do you prefer to add metformin and vildagliptin from the start of treatment? Yeah, this uh, the stu the verified study is uh, is uh, quite uh, illustrating of this that uh, you can really. Uh, prolong the time for this for the failure if you do that early so even though it's not yet in the guidelines i think it will become more and more important that uh, to start uh, the combination and um, if you think of the pathophysiology it's um, uh, could be quite natural that metformin targets insulin resistance and uh, uh, whereas the, the dpp4 targets the islet dysfunction so therefore you can treat both aspects of the disease by using them. So I would say that this would be a very important uh, uh, option. And um, of course, uh, that it would be good with some other studies also. Uh, so we don't have only one study, but this verified study is very convincing. In this. The second question, <laughs> you, I am expecting a short answer for this. 
Can DPP-4 be used with GLP-1 receptor analog? No, that's no use. And that, that's you. When you think of incretin therapy, you need to select one of them, DPP-4 or GLP-1. The third question, is there any association between DPP-4 and GIT malignancy, especially colorectal cancer? No, it's... Uh, <coughs> It's been studied a lot, uh, and uh, there are hundreds and thousands of patients now in different databases, and there is no increased risk uh, uh, of uh, GI uh, cancer. Uh, I would like to add to this, uh, to, to, to the answer of this question and to the following question, the role of DPP-4 in COVID, that DPP-4 is known to be a CD26 lymphocyte surface protein. Yeah. It plays a role in T-cell mediated organ specific immunity. Yes. It can suppress T helper 1 and T helper 17 and upregulate T helper 2 cell regulation of T cell. This means clinical practice that this is a protective immunity against cancer and viruses in general. So for those who uh, ask this uh, question and the following question of DPP-4 and COVID, we can say that uh, no, DPP-4 inhibitors are protective agents rather than uh, agents which may induce uh, neoplasma or uh, exacerbate virus infection. Do you agree, Professor? I agree, uh, although it has not been shown that uh, there actually is a reduction in cancer, but... Uh, yeah. uh, at, least, at least it's not carcinogenic on the... Exactly, and that's the main uh, point, I think, that there, it's not carcinogenic, and uh, both from experimental studies and the studies, like you said, on the T-cell and so, but uh, also on the clinical, uh, long-term clinical studies and different databases and so. The fifth question, uh, in case of renal impairment, which do you prefer, vildagliptin or linagliptin? Well, <coughs> uh, you, you can use either way, either of them. There is no, no one you can say that you prefer them or not. But there is a difference in the dosing that you use uh, uh, 50 milligram uh, of villagliptin, whereas in once, whereas if you have no renal impairment, you use 50 milligram twice daily. Uh, but uh, in, for linagliptin, you don't need to change the dose. But that's the only difference. Uh, and um, uh, this is not because there is any toxicity, it's just because it's because of the pharmacokinetics of the substances. So if you just consider that, you can use either of them. They have been shown to be good, both of them. Is there a beneficial impact of DPP-4 inhibitors on the lipid profile? Yes, it's... Um, DPP-4 uh, inhibitor? Of yes, the lipid profile. It, yeah, it improves the lipid profiles in uh, uh, when uh, in almost all studies there is an improvement of uh, lipid profiles, but not so much as statins, of course. So you cannot use them as such, but there is always a trend of having an improved uh, lipid lipid profile in the different um, uh, studies. I saw one very interesting question on type I'm one. Very yeah. And yeah. uh, I think I think that was a very, very good question because we have done studies in type one diabetes and it works, but the the net effect is small compared to if you just change the insulin dose. So therefore, you really, if you want to add it, you really first have to uh, uh, to um, dose adjust the insulin. So. Uh, yeah, but the effect is quite small. But from a theoretical uh, background, it's good to reduce the glucagon also in type two, type one diabetes. Yes, because this is the coming question uh, on type one. So you mean that it will be given uh, as an adjunction of insulin treatment to de to decrease the uh, increment in weight and perhaps the dose and. Uh, uh, but but it will not replace the insulin. We should make this exactly. Clear. It will never replace the insulin. But the studies have shown that uh, you can reduce the insulin dose 
and protect from some hypoglycemia. And that's because you're, uh, you uh, have this um, uh, change in glucagon and so. Uh, but the effect is so small, so therefore it's not been uh, um, approved from, from FDA or so to be used in that. Uh, is there so a useful impact of DPP-4 inhibitors on liver steatosis? So called well, fatty liver? Yeah, there, there is. Uh, uh, there is a study comparing DPP-4 and GLP-1. Uh, GLP-1 has a clear effect on uh, steatosis, but when uh, uh, a study comparing GLP-1 receptor agonist and DPP-4 found that GLP-1 receptor agonist was more potent than uh, DPP-4 inhibitor. So the answer is that yes, it can improve uh, liver steatosis, but not as much as uh, GLP-1 receptor agonist. In case of uh, a patient with renal transplant, uh, what is the best anti-diabetic treatment to, you would uh, recommend? Well, uh, it, uh, it depends, of course, not only, uh, it depends on the A1C and body weight and so on, but uh, you can use DP before, that's no problem. It's safe and uh, uh, you can use it for, uh, with the same indication that you can start treatment or you can use it together with insulin and so so, uh, so that's a very good treatment also after renal transplantation. I expect a short question for next, uh, uh, the short answer for next question, the role of DPP-4 in gestational diabetes. Yes, uh, it's the same. You can use it in gestational diabetes. It's the same, yes. Can it be used in gestational diabetes? Yes, it can. Uh, the role of DPP-4 in pre-diabetes? Well, this is... Uh, <laughs> if, if you ask that from a scientific point of view, uh, not thinking of the regulators or so, it, it, it would be very good to use in pre-diabetes because already in pre-diabetes, you have these changes in insulin and glucagon. That's why you develop pre-diabetes. And therefore to have a treatment where you can correct the islet dysfunction would be very good. On the other hand, it's not approved for that. So from a regulatory point of view, uh, you cannot, so you probably will never get reimbursement or so for such a treatment. Uh, but uh, from a scientific point of view, there is not a clear line between pre-diabetes and diabetes, but more a gradual development and where DPP-4 can be good from the beginning. Uh, uh, another question, should we stop ACE inhibitors in patients with COVID-19? This has been answered in many recent publications. Yes, this is uh, discussed a lot uh, all over the world now because it seems as hypertension uh, is uh, the most important risk factor for severe COVID-19. And uh, since it works through AC2 and uh, AC inhibitors increase the expression of AC2, there, there are theoretical considerations that you should um, stop them. On the other hand, from a clinical point of view, it's more important really to treat the hypertension and not to say to patients that um, they should stop it because then they will get high blood pressure. So therefore, uh, therefore the, the advice is now is that we need, this is a concern, but uh, it's not such strange concern that we will have it as a regulation or a rule for, or a suggestion for the patient. So the, for the patient is you need to keep your treatment for hypertension. Certainly, I, I second uh, your opinion, Professor, because a recent publication has shown that uh, stopping of ACE inhibitor or ARBs have been associated with an increased morbidity and mortality. Exactly. Up to 34%. Exactly. So, so it's, um, it's very serious for us yeah. to say to stop it. And, uh, yeah. But I think from a theoretical point of view, this discussion will go on. Is there any precaution for the use of DPP-4 other than saxagliptin in heart failure? No, that's the only one and that's, that relates to saxagliptin. And it's actually very strange because uh, um, the other DPP-4 inhibitors have, has not such a hint on that. And why should saxagliptin be different? It must be either something 
with the saxagliptin molecule, or it could be just uh, uh, in that study. Sometimes you have a bad luck in the statistics in the study, but it's a clear significant result in that study. But for others, there is no such um, problem. Or In the leader program, after some time, glucagon, there was a paradoxical increase in glucagon. What is your interpretation? And either with, the, with the lir liraglutide or yeah, yeah, there was an increase there, and uh, um, it's very hard to to understand this because all other studies show that there is a reduction, and uh, it could be that if you stop treatment, there is an upregulation, so it goes up. Uh, but uh, from apart from that, it's very difficult to understand, and that's not been reproduced in other studies. So we don't know really. Also, uh, answer uh, to this question: What about DPP-4 inhibitor and pancreatitis? Yeah, that's also been discussed very much, uh, and because in some studies there is a slight increased risk for pancreatitis, but if you take all studies together, uh, there is no increased risk. But uh, five, six years ago, there was really an intense discussion on this, and. And that made both the FDA and the EMA to make uh, special studies of this. And, uh, uh, and uh, they come to the conclusion that there is no real evidence that there is an increased risk. On the other hand, they say that you can never say that you, there is absolutely no risk. And therefore they say that if in a patient who have had a pancreatitis, you should not use especially GLP-1s, but also DPP-4. Uh, what do you think about the combination of DPP-4 and SGLT2? Yeah, that, uh, that uh, is, uh, from a theoretical point of view, a very good combination because then you can take use of the SGLT2 effect, reduce the body weight and uh, its effect on uh, glucose, and at the same time through the DPP-4, prevent the increase in glucagon. So, and therefore you can expect synergistic effect of those two. So that could be a very good combination. I believe the rest of the questions have been answered during your talk. Uh, okay, very good questions. So, yes. <laughs> uh, I would like to, to thank you, Professor. And uh, uh, I would like to conclude that uh, there is no, uh, what we, can call better class of drug. Uh, there is a better choice and better planning. Uh, planning, the therapeutic plan for a patient should be individualized for every patient. Uh, so the, the best class for patient A would not be the best class for patient B. Uh, certainly DPP-4 has its credit. It's an oral therapy, safe, effective, liable to match any combination or most of the combinations, a good cost-benefit ratio, no hypoglycemia or minimal hypoglycemia, compatible with FAST, no deleterious effect on cardiovascular or renal uh, issues, uh, can be used in elderly patients. So this is a class of drug which can be put uh, in your... Uh, armamentarium of anti-diabetic drug. Uh, I believe I, I'm left with the thanking uh, Eva Pharma for its uh, scientific activity, uh, the E-Academy, uh, to thank the team of Eva Pharma uh, for their uh, support, logistic, uh, technical and scientific support, uh, to thank Professor Aaron for a wonderful, comprehensive, and uh, very uh, interesting presentation uh, with cases and updated uh, literature and uh, a wonderful audience which uh, at some time reached uh, a bit below 300 which is a very good for a friday evening during ramadan uh, best wishes for all and uh, keep safe thank you thank you very much thank you Thank you, Prof. Aran, for your great, elegant presentation and discussion. Thank you, Prof. Samir, for your great moderation and conclusion. Thank you so much for the attendees. Please let me share with you some slides about Liptis.
الحقيقه طبعا يصعب عليا ان انا يعني يبقى صعب عليا ان انا اعرف ازاي اتكلم بعد بروفيسور اران وبعد بروفيسور سمير بس حابه تشار بعض السلايدز عن الجليبتس سبيسيفيكلي يمكن الجليبتس عنده بالانس بين الافكسي والسيفتي وده اللي بيخليه سوتبل للديفرنت بيشنت بروفايل يمكن دكتور سمير كان لسه منشنينج دلوقتي انه في ديفرنت بيشنت بروفايلز وكل واحد فيهم بيختلف النيد بتاعته هو محتاج ايه ولكن لانه الجليبتس عنده بالانس بين السيفتي والافكسي ده بيضمنه انه يكون ايفكتيف اند سيف وسوتبل للديفرنت بيشنت بروفايلز اكشلي ده جاي من نتيجه اليونيك ميكانيزم اوف اكشن بتاعه لانه بيعمل انيبيشن للدي بي بي 4 انزيم فبيسمح لي الانسولين سكريشن والجلوكاجون سكريشن ان جلوكوز ديبندنت مانر فبالتالي بيضمن دايما ان يكون الهايبوجليسيميا اولموست ما فيش او مينيمال زي ما ذكر دكتور سمير فعلا انها تكون قليله جدا فبيحصل البالانس ده ما بين السيفتي والافكسي اكشلي البالانس ده بيبقى سوتبل جدا للديفرنت بيشنت بروفايلز يمكن معظمهم حضراتكم بتشوفوهم او ممكن بتشوفوا كلهم فعلا اول حاجه زي مثلا بيشنت الاوبيز او الاوفر ويت حضرتك بتبقى عايز تكتب له دواء ما يزودلوش الوزن بتاعه بيكون الجليبتس هنا سوتبل للبيشنت ده او البيشنت اللي عنده رينال امبيرمنت اي ثينك كان ده سؤال دايركتد لبروفيسور اران هل هو اوكي بالنسبه له البلد جليبتن فكان رد فعلا ان بيكون بس دوز ادجستمنت ولكن هنا بيكون فيري سوتبل بيتاخد وانس ديلي سوتبل كمان للالدرلي بيشنت لانه بيضمن البالانس والسيفتي والافكسي. سوتبل للبيشنتس اللي سسبتبل للهايبوجليسيميا لان بخاف جدا على البيشنتس اللي عندهم هاي ريسك اوف هايبوجليسيميا فبيكون الجليبتس او الجليبتس بلس سوتبل ليهم. سوتبل للبيشنتس النيولي دايجنوز دايباتيك بيشنت اكوردنج للفيريفاي ستادي وي كان انيشيت جليبتس بلس ات تايم اوف انيشيشن للبيشنتس دول. سوتبل كمان للبيشنتس اللي بتصوم رمضان لان طبعا هنا الريسك بتاع الهايبوجليسيميا بيكون عالي. اوريدي الهايبوجلاسيميا ليها كونسيكونسز كتيره جدا زي الهوسبيتاليزيشن كوست الكارديو فاسكولار كومبليكيشنز وتجي نتيجه الديفانسيف ايتنج ومشاكل ثانيه كتير. ولكن طبعا الهايبوجلاسيميا بتزيد جدا في رمضان وبيكون ده الريسك العالي ودي اكتر مخاوف حاجه الدكتور بيفكر فيها هي الهايبوجلاسيميا. ولكن طبعا بعض البيشنتس يمكن كتير منهم بيبقى حضرتك مثلا بتنصحهم ان هم ما يصوموش لكن هو بيكون مصمم انه يصوم فبالتالي هنا بيكون تشالنج ازاي اقدر اخلي المريض بتاعي يعدي فتره رمضان بسلام. وجود الجليبتس بيضمن البيشنتس ان هم ما يكسروش صيامهم يمكن دي حاجه طبعا بتضايقهم جدا يكون صايم ونفسه يصوم بس انه يكسر صيامه فبالتالي الجليبتس هنا بيكون سوتبل جدا للبيشنتس اللي بتصوم رمضان. علشان ما يكسرش صيامه وفي نفس الوقت بنضمن كمان ان بعد كده لما البيشنت يعدي رمضان ما يبقاش في زياده في الوزن لان ده طبعا بيكون تشالنج كبير جدا. at the same time مش بس بنفكر في السيفتي لا بنفكر كمان في الافكسي ان ايفن حتى كمان ال اتش بي اي 1 سي بيكون كمان مونيتورد مع البيشنتس دول لو هنتكلم عن الهايبوجليسيميا ديفينتلي بيلد جليبتن ويت كومبيرد للسالفونال يوريز اقل بكتير جدا فيري سيجنيفيكانت ريدكشن في الكيسز اللي عندها هايبوجليسيميا فيرسس كل السالفونال يوريز بكل المولكيولز بتاعتها واي ثينك هو ده اللي يهم حضراتكم جدا ده الجليبتس رينج الجليبتس 50 ملغ جليبتس بلس 50 على 1000 الجليبتس بلس 50 على 850 لو بالنسبه نتكلم على البرايسز بتاعتهم الجليبتس بلس 50 على 1000 وال50 على 850 ب 104 والمانثلي كوست بتاعهم 208 لو هيستخدموا مرتين في اليوم الجليبتس بين 95 وربع وهنا بقى لو بنتكلم كمان على البيشنت لو رينال امبيرمنت بيشنت وهيتاخد وانس فبتبقى المانثلي كوست 95 وربع لو بيشنت عادي وعنده فينا الامبيرمنت بيستخدم توايس وهنا هيكون ب 190 جنيه ونص. باكد طبعا ان هو افيلبل في كل الصيدليات ومتواجد جدا لان هو ده الاوبجيكتيف بتاعنا ان احنا نوفر الدواء لكل مريض. الدوز بتاعته جنرالي هي مرتين في اليوم وطبعا في رمضان برضه بتكون مرتين مره في الفطار ومره في السحور. حابه اشكر حضراتكم جدا وحابه اشكر تاني كل الاساتذه بتوعنا كل الدكاتره من مصر كل الدكاتره من العراق وليبيا من عمان سبيشلي كمان من رويال العمان بوليس هوسبيتال ثانك يو ليكو كلكم حابه اكد بس على اخر حاجه ان هيكون في سيرفي بعد ما حضرتك تقفل على طول السيشن هنا هيكون في سيرفي عن الويبينار نفسها عن بعض الكويستشنز عن الجليبتس وهيبقى في راندوم سيلكشن لبعض الدكاتره تو وين فايف اونلاين جورنال سبسكريبشن ساينتفيك جورنال سبسكريبشن متشرفين جدا بوجودكم معانا ومتشكرين جدا لحضراتكم كلكم. ثانك يو سو ماتش. ثانك يو بروفيسورز. ثانك يو. ثانك يو. باي.